God's not going to force you to do something for him. He's not going to force you. Come on now, Susie, get out there. I want you to go and do whatever you need to do for me, for the kingdom. And God, ah, 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 okay. No, not happening like that. Your, your eyes are either eyes wide open and you realize I came here for this purpose or you are still asleep. We will be in John 15, at least for the opening of this message. Now, back to people asking. Well, how does this work? You're asking me to help God by presenting myself, submitting myself, and then you're asking me to act in faith, but you're asking me to do nothing? Well, I'm very confused. Hopefully this makes it a little bit more plain. So let me read, because I know that we do have folks that tune in that do not have Bibles in front of them. So John 15, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth. He purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine no more. Can ye except ye abide in me, I am, the I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words, my remas, not my logos, but my remas, the sayings, that is both, you'll find them both in old and new, if my remas, my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. And so just so you know, if you have a Bible like mine, you're going to see the numbers that are beside abide, continue, remain, are all the same word in Greek, 3306 in the Strong's Concordance, Meno, the Greek word and all of its uh, declensions in different states. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. And this is where I want you to focus. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, abide, continue. And whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things that command you that you love one another. So that whole chapter and focusing on verse 16 pretty much gives a clarity about something. And people are asking me, for example, the how-tos of all this. Well, let me just say this. God has, he has these patterns. They repeat themselves. So you'll find there are representations of God's people through the book. For example, you'll find that in some places it's clusters of grapes. Some places it's baskets of figs. Here, in this example, he basically makes it very, very plain. So if you've ever, if you've ever tried to grow anything, Several concepts apply here. If you grow something and it becomes very leafy, usually you cut back the leaf so that everything can be concentrated in the fruit, that 
all of the goodness, all of the energy goes into the fruit. If you think about it, a branch that's even slightly severed will die and produce no fruit. There are all these concepts that are in nature that are spiritual, that apply. So it's important to kind of put that there and then also remember that God has used this imagery before. In Isaiah 5, he talks about this vineyard. Isaiah 5, the parable of vineyard, he says, now I will sing forth and I'm going to read it to you. My well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, he fenced it, gathered out the stones thereof, planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a winepress therein, and looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. You'll find a lot of these pictures appear throughout the Old Testament and into the New. So not uncommon to where God would use imagery to basically point to people. So this is completely the way God would do this. John 15 is no different. If you read it carefully, it's crystal clear. The father is the husbandman. Uh, we are the branches. He is the vine. We must be connected in order for fruit to come. We must be... Now here's the the scripture that says purged, I've talked about this last week, catheterized, cleansed. Think of it this way. The more fruitful a person is, the more God is attentive to clipping on you. Boy, that sounds really good, doesn't it? <laughs> so you might ask yourself uh, why when, when we're reading in the Gospels, for example, uh, Jesus in Matthew 21, he makes a statement and he says, Therefore I say unto you that the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Because, again, remember, we've, I've said this before, he came to his own, his own received him not. His own would have been the nation of fruit. They rejected him. And our tendency... As Christians, as people who study the book, our tendency is to remove ourselves, to not see. Our tendency is no different than the people who are cataloged in this book, to detach ourselves from their failures, to see God, to recognize God's hand. We know that the children of Israel, for example, they were his original vine. They were the purpose in which he believed all fruit would flow. And of course, we know, I've covered this in many different messages in many different ways. Um, the, the purpose was to lead them into a land. They would prosper. And if you think about it, everything is the Garden of Eden, basically repeated over and over a theme where God will finally achieve or receive what he set out to do in the beginning. And there's, it's, it's constantly repeated until you get to the book of Revelation where... Once more, the tree of life reappears. So the whole concept that God is trying to basically reestablish the unity with man cannot be done until the coming of Christ. So my point is to say if we can learn, and I don't mean that we haven't learned. I'm talking about really take it to ourselves that here are people that had every proof, every word, every evidence, and yet they still would not follow God's word. They would not heed God's warning. We are in a good position. Because sometimes when you've got internal crisis, you're able to stop everything and, as I've said many times, do a spiritual inventory, see where you're at, maybe do a little self-reflection. So if, like God choosing a people to become a nation, that they should have bore God fruit, that they should have brought forth everything that God desired of them, and they did not, it's very clear. God has now moved to a new nation, the people who are in Christ. And I, I use it, I phrase it that way to say, no longer a territorial issue, oh, that will come in the end of days, but for the sake of the saving of souls, it's the people who belong to the Lord. 
the church. So here we are, and we have a big problem. Because if you read carefully, he says, every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And I want you to think and camp out on that for a minute. This isn't like somebody sitting down to say, I think I'm going to do thus and so for God. We're talking about the yielded vessel that faiths, that trusts God, that says God will use me in a fashion that he himself knows will be the best, the best outcome. But read again. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And then read down in verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, is withered, and men gather them. That's very interesting. So think of it, these were people that had some context of being in the presence of Christ or near to the vine, and they are withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire. And I was thinking about that. Could, that. could that mean people who hypothetically came curiously into the church? Because this is about people who are connected to Christ. And this should also silence the people that say, once saved, always saved. That gives you a little bit better explanation if you're going to pick this apart. But the reality is this, and this is what I want you to focus on. Um, the men that gathered them, who knows, who's to say that that's not, we'll call it pseudo, pseudo believers in the world. Come on, well, come with me, or come with us, or listen to this. But it doesn't matter, because what? They are cast into the fire, and they're burned. These are people that actually had some kind of contact with Christ. Branches somehow connected to the vine at some point. Now, he takes away that which is dead, rotten, unproductive, or useless. So I'm going to ask this. It's a very strange question to ask because I, don't, I think none of us have even scratched the surface of what God desires of us. Now, I prepare messages every week, and I come here and I'm talking to you and I'm delivering these messages, and I could say, well, this is my fruit. No, it's not. This is my calling, my vocation. See, we get confused about things. And what I do with my calling or my vocation, what you do with your calling, you are called, you are chosen, you are called, now we get into the real nubbin of this. God's not going to force you to do something for him. He's not going to force you, come on now, Susie, get out there. I want you to go and do whatever you need to do for me, for the kingdom. And ah, 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 Okay. No, not happening like that. Your, your eyes are either eyes wide open and you realize I came here for this purpose or you are still asleep and maybe even in delusion that you think somehow I've arrived. Now all the other peons can do the work. And I'm sure there are people like that within the body of Christ as well. God help us. So here's what I, I want you to think about. If, if the Lord himself is talking about all this, I remember where this takes place in John's gospel. Now John, who wrote the book of Revelation, he talks about these churches of Asia Minor and if you think about it, they could be viewed in terms of fruit-bearing or not fruit-bearing. Very clearly, when you see, for example, one of them, and we, we should, the whole church body should be careful to never gloat. Oh, we don't do that, or we've never done that. Be careful, because there is nobody that can say, I have walked perfectly. So, caution. But in the book of Revelation, we read that, the words to that church, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast less, left thy first love. Do you think that there are churches even today 
who fit, even though that could be churches through the ages, but there are churches today that fit that bill, left their first love. They would prefer to do anything but under the guise of church. As long as we can call it this, but we do these other things. Left your first love. Well, what is the church supposed to be doing? What is the first love of the church? Saving of souls, the preaching of the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. But when that is gone, and when the, we'll call it the oomph, the initial, I'm, I'm here, I've arrived, or this is so cool, or I've, my eyes are open. After that initial, whatever that is, fades, what exactly is left? And the warning to that church is repent. Repent, or else I will come to thee quickly, remove thy candlestick, take away essentially the light from within you. Now, if, think about this. At the time that John was writing, and even if these churches represent church ages, they equally must represent some concept of the church in the time that John was writing. So it's very simple and very plain to say that the church was already having its issues. In some other place in the book of Revelation in these churches, we read about the synagogue of Satan. I know where Satan's seat is, and it's speaking again, to a church. So if, if we've all perfectly arrived, say, in 30 years from the time of Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, and within 30 years or less, you've got churches that are completely gone off the rails. Corinth, Ephesus, I mean, there isn't a church in here that doesn't essentially need correction, and then the churches that are being spoken of in the book of Revelation, as I said, whether that represents church ages, actual churches in Asia Minor, there is a point right up to the time where we see Jesus in the church actually outside knocking on the door wanting to come in, and you don't think that that's kind of where the church at large is in this current day and age? When you have people standing in the pulpit modifying the word of God and telling you somehow, you know, I told you this a couple of weeks ago, I watched a very disgusting and disturbing clip on social media of a, I believe it was a Methodist church, and the person in the pulpit delivering whatever it was that they were delivering, I'm, I was disturbed by it. Because every, every word that was supposedly being read was modified and changed. And the, the precursor to this is that the word of God is not enough. I'm sorry, open your evil eyes. The word of God has been enough for the last 2,000 years for people to come to salvation Suddenly it's not enough in this day and age because you're special? I don't think so. So what we end up with are people who will rationalize right to the very end. Now I'm not saying that we are guilty of that, but I am saying to you that it becomes more and more clear, especially when we're talking about authentic Christianity. I've been repeating this, and there's a reason why I've been repeating this. Because if your faith, your understanding of things is authentically genuine, but by that I mean there is no agenda, there is no hidden something, we will never be the people recorded in this book per se, living at a different time, simply because of, we'll call it the progression of society. I don't know that that's a real thing, but what I'm saying is we don't ride around on donkeys anymore. But the concept is the same. So when people say to me, well, you, you're, I hear what you're teaching, and you've, you've put out all the tools, but how? Well, if, if I am a branch, and I am connected to the vine, and the vine is connected, directly connected, to and with the husbandman, that means that everything that I need to bear fruit is there because of my connection right into the source of all things. Does that make sense? So 
The question then is, what more do I need? What else do I need to do to be useful and profitable to God to bear fruit? What else do I need to do? And here, now usher in the people who will completely muddy the water. Because they, in their mind, there has to be something more. When the mind or the body is presented to the Lord, as I've said, quoting Romans 12, as I've said, quoting Romans 6, to whom ye yield your members. That is to whom you're either going to yield your members to God or to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And wherever you are yielding, and that's who you will be serving. So then maybe the first place to stop and ask yourself something, and this is not designed to make anybody miserable, bad, sad, whatever. It's designed to really be self-reflecting questions. If I know what we've all read, that God will use that surrendered tool, that surrendered vessel, so then the big question begins, am I hindering God's plan for me? Or am I not understanding and still trying to do it in my own? Am I frustrating? And probably the answer to a lot of those types of questions is yes. Because it's so hard, even when you have been taught for 20, 30, 40 years, the life of faith, it is so hard to get rid of the idea somehow that I will do something that will change everything. No, 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 no. What I do that changes everything is in my yielding, in my submission, in my trust and faithing that God will. Remember I spoke about the person asking for healing who really needs healing. You get up and you start acting as though God has already healed you. That's the process. Well, I'm going to get up and I'm going to start acting as though God, well, I don't have to. He's already equipped me. Now I start walking as though I am a conduit. And I'm not walking around looking for victims. I am now being led. This is why Paul said, if you walk in the Spirit, you will be led by the Spirit, coming under the influences. If you remember, I taught on that word to be led, to come under the influence of. That doesn't mean against your will, which means even in the moment when God places those opportunities in front of you, He still gives you the free will to bleep it up. Okay? And that's the wonder of God. He's not asking us to be the wind-up tools that most people think. That's the way it works. It does not. So, very important. Everything the branch needs to bear fruit is in the vine. Please just put this somewhere. Everything you need to bear fruit is in the vine. Who are you? You're a branch. Who is the vine? That was three of you. There is no fruit without this connection. So now you can take these passages and put them beside Galatians 5 and you can see how you almost got a complete picture here. Understanding that the operation of the Spirit is that, essentially, that connection. So, as I said, the Greek word here for remain, abide, continue, meno, which can connote to stay, to dwell, to tarry, state or condition, the relation to which one person or thing stands with another. The idea here is an intimate connection. So Christ takes up his abode in the believer. We read this in many different places. And again, Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's so many of these that it's hard to understand how anybody could say, I still don't know how this operation works. Christ takes the abode in the believer. The believer trusts Christ, abides in him. So the life of Christ becomes the life of the believer, and the life of the believer becomes the channel or the conduit through which the Lord expresses himself. Go back to Galatians. The, we'll call it the outraying of the fruit of the Spirit, what, what was left in the wake of God's operation. So this is, as I said, the concept I've been trying to teach, not just for the individual, but equally also for the church. Think of the church 
again, I go back to all these churches in the book of Revelation. Thou hast a name and livest, but thou art dead. I really believe that there are many religious institutions just like that. A name, but dead. And if we were to pick these apart, you know, this is the thing. I no longer feel like I have to navigate this carefully. Because any person who's really digging, who's really looking for the genuine article of faith, you have quit chasing after the fairy tales. You have quit chasing after the venerated uh, hair locked away in some shrine somewhere. And you are looking to the invisible, to exactly what Hebrews says, something you cannot see, you cannot feel, but you know by virtue of faith that it is and he is, and that he ever liveth to make intercession. So think about this. This is scary what I'm talking about now, because if I say to you that God wants to use you and wants to use me, and no checkbook, no place where I can place the, okay, did this, check that, you know, to guarantee, to ensure that I'm checking every box for success versus I'm stepping out in faith. And maybe you take the posture that says, I am, I am here in the spirit of Elijah. Care more about God's word, in the, particularly in these days, and think about this. What else can Faith Center, a church like Faith Center, or any church struggling in this particular place, what else should we do except turn back, turning to God and saying, this is, this is your work. We're needing your help. And God's word says, well, I've already given you the help. Now let me show you how to use the help, which starts with understanding you're already connected. This is what John 15 shows me, I'm already connected. I am the branch connected to the vine through which all the source of everything that I need or require to produce that fruit flows. Your connection is going to basically dictate. It's going to drive. And that verse 16, you have not chosen me. I wish that I could get that into more people's ear. If you really believe this, you know how many people say, they were searching for God. They found God. No, God found you. It is prevenient grace, which makes it even more incredible that God came to find your miserable being or mine. You don't think God has better things to do, but condescended in that moment to come to you or to me. So I, I don't want to get, I'm kind of going off in other places, but here's the thing. What I want us to kind of go back to it's the idea that a branch could bear nothing, could be unprofitable and think that branch was connected to the vine. It takes you immediately back to the parable of the sower. These are all interconnected. So God's saying the same thing in different ways, in different places in the book. And if you read it all, put it all together, you see, okay, there should be an attitude amongst people who are even listening to this message that almost at one point kind of grabs hold and says, I've got to pinch myself for a second because we're, we become so familiar with church that we don't actually stop and think, I'm pretty lucky that God chose me. Out of a sea of people, he did not choose. And you put your name there and speak for yourself. So think about this because this is what I'm trying to tell you. And then also think about the fact that within this passage, he talks about ones that are not profitable, branches that are not profitable, that are gathered up and burned. Not God. Men gather them and they are burned. I think all of this leads me to a conclusion about something. And please don't, don't make this, you know, God has a calling for each and every one of us. God has a charge for each and every one of us. And then you say, but, but I'm not called for this. You don't even know what you're called for. That's my guess. But there is one thing. There is a common denominator in every single child of God's calling, no matter where you fit in, because we're all in one body, different members, hands, head, feet, but all attached to the same body. Becomes very important to recognize, just like the gift ministers 
all saying the same thing, all attached to the word. The body lives by the word in different functions. If you look at that, what Corinthians talks about, all of those functionings are attached to different parts of the body, but all parts of the body are attached to Christ, which comes back to without me, you can do nothing. So when the church is saying, I'm stuck, we're not moving. We have arrested development. We're drying up on the vine. The first thing that I think we need to focus on is that connection, branches to vine. We don't even have to think about the vine to the husbandman because that's a fact. But the branches to the vine, that tight connection, that connection that is daily, that is perpetual, and has seasons. The seasons are not, you're not, a tree does not produce fruit year round. It does have seasons. And then it has seasons where it looks dead and dormant. It has seasons where it needs to be pruned. Seasons for everything, which again, impossible to get away from the scriptures. The book of Ecclesiastes says a season for everything. So again, what I'm trying to tell you is that this, this passage coupled with Galatians and some of even the key words in this passage, the abiding, remaining, continuing, that concept that says God is in you, God is with you, God is helping you. So we are not left to our own devices. We are not left to say, well, what the heck are we going to do here with Faith Center? You know, when we were, I think I told you this, when we were downtown, we, were, we had this building, the downtown building, and the studio just across town here. And manning these buildings and a whole bunch of other locations, and you really begin to ask yourself the question, I'll never forget this time, where it was like, well, why are we doing that over there? You start to ask questions. And those questions were what started me thinking, well, why are we holding a service there when we got an empty building here? Logical thing. We're moving the church back to Glendale. Pretty simple. There are logical steps in this problem of the church that you take the first step. The first step is to not be delusional about the problem. It exists. We're an aging congregation. We are in, we'll call it, uh, you know, if, if this was, if we were all Armenians in this church, right, and this is a very Armenian community, that might work out well for us, but we're not. There's a whole litany of different challenges that this church particularly faces. Then if I think about, for example, the church up north, it has its own dilemmas. You've got a couple of churches right, literally right across the street that way and right across the street that way. And maybe there it's the question of, we've, we've, we've got a nicer building. No, we've got a nicer building. Who the hell cares about your building? I care about whether you're going to hell or not. I care about the fact whether the word is going forth, and I care whether or not people are actually aware that God actually, he actually expects you to show up full of faith, ready for battle. This is not some, you know, milk toast, as I said, wimpy, oh, we'll just go cower in the corner somewhere. So, we must actually have the desire, by the way, to bear fruit. Doesn't, we're not praying to bear, bear fruit. We're not asking God for fruit. But we should have the desire to bear fruit. And that desire comes from, if you go back in here, I know this is going to, for some of you, it's just a hard pill to swallow. But that comes out when Jesus tells his, his disciples to con continue ye in my love. Not our love. We already covered this in the fruit of the Spirit in one of those first messages on love. So his love, what does his love look like? It's not like our love. He said, continue in my love. And that is a love that cares for everything that is lost. That is a love that cares for those that are sick, those that just cannot. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about just between us, hey, we're the family of God, and we love each other. You can, I've seen that doesn't really work too well. So understanding what's said here 
requires a little bit of reflection, requires, again, to not be saying, yeah, I read that, I understand it, but, but then nothing else happens with this. And that is really, at the top of everything, I really believe is a big concern. What I'm telling you is we need to take back the reins of the church. And taking them back requires getting back into the mindset of being connected to Christ. And as I am connected to him, he makes everything possible. As I am connected to him, the eyes of my understanding, by the way, can be even opened to a greater degree where I might actually see. I've never said this to you before, but I'm going to say it now because it, it bears saying. I remember many years ago, Dr. Scott talking about, you know, if people wanted their children to grow up and become preachers. And most people wouldn't want that based on what you see of most of what the church has become. And I agree with that. The sad part, there is a lack of true, absolute heart for God, burden for the lost in the body of Christ. Huge problem. You know, I've thought about this a lot. Wouldn't it be great if God gave me the burden of having really truly to make disciples? Wouldn't that be like the most incredible burden to receive? But people have to believe that they have a purpose and people have to believe that God will use them. There has to be the mindset that says there's a whole sea of people out there. And whether it's because God raises you up to preach or God raises you up to a ministry of helps or God raises you up out of the pit you came from, there is a purpose in all this. And it's not simply for you or for I to become filled, vessels completely filled up with all of this wealth of the riches and knowledge of Christ for it to go where? So this is what I'm saying. Part of this series requires reflection on these things because these lessons reveal that if we are truly desiring to see God's work prosper, it must be his work being brought about. And I know I've just been repeating this ad nauseum, but it must be his work being wrought through us. And that fruit that is produced is to the glory of God. Now think about this because there'd be plenty of people that would say, be much easier in fact, I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago that said, don't you think it'd be much easier if you just moved the church to Texas? <laughs> well, if everything was just that easy, right? <laughs> no. You know, this is the mindset that produces weak people. You know what produces tough people? Tough times. In tough times, you've got to do what you've got to do and you figure out how to do it and you don't play around because, you know, if you don't do it, there's probably no one else to do it for you. The best thing that could happen out of this messed up state is it produces a bunch of really strong people who can be the driving force for change, for real change, not the change that we've all heard of for the last... <laughs> Yes, we can. Si, si puede. Okay. <laughs> Don't even go there. Now, somebody might say, well, okay, you're, you're, you're preaching these messages. Give some examples to us. What do we look like now? Well, right now, you might look like a doubting Thomas. You kind of want to believe this is true, but kind of scary all the components that go with it. Some of you are definitely like Peter. Periodically you say the most amazing things, but not always. And then you've got a couple here that might be a little bit more like James. I'm not going to even elaborate on that statement. But what's important to see is their attitude after the ascension, their attitude after the day of Pentecost, 
their attitude in the writing that tells you, listen, Peter, who swung the sword, and Jesus said, put that thing away, I could have called legions. We're kind of silly that way. We think if we don't do this particular act, God can't come up with something on how to do it, but that's what he does. That's what he's always done. So I think we have to start making this more about, yes, have we engaged in some really dumb things along the way? Absolutely, haven't we all? Now comes the time to roll up the sleeves and say, if we're really going to be serious and be that beacon of light church and be what I've continued to say, authentic and genuine, not looking for people to come in here and say, well, if you're not, if you're not praying on your knees or if your hands aren't in the air while the music's going or if you're not looking to the right or to the left, not interested in that. That's what people want to impress upon you. I'm asking you to be interested in what God is going to impress upon you as you push all of those ideas away and say, I'm interested only in God and his authentic activity within me, towards me, and through me that I might accomplish his purposes. And when that mindset is there, and it may not stay there continually, you might have to do these daily readjustments to make sure that you understand there is a mission, a calling. And unfortunately, I think we, we, we do have people that maybe are to the point of saying, I think I understand, I think I'm ready, I think I know, and will go out with the best intentions and the greatest heart and revert back to type. Do you know what I'm saying? See, just Maybe I'm going to just kill this horse once and for all. I think probably it was about 10 years ago, and we had, we had a meeting, and we were talking about, well, if we want to get people in the church. And I remember we, we had made flyers, and we had, we had come up with, there were so many great ideas, but the only idea that was never spoken of. See, I can stand here and I can smile about it, because that even shows I grow too. I must grow with you, okay? It's not like I've arrived and you're still coming along and getting there. We're all growing. Then you realize that wouldn't have worked anyway, and the best that that would have done was produced people coming in for the wrong reasons, not being drawn by God, but by some fleshly, um, we'll call it influence. Oh, you know, come on, we'll, we'll go to church and then I'll take you out for lunch. Yeah, that's okay. I'm not saying that that's a terrible thing. But what happens if you don't have to do any of that because it's still operations of the flesh? What happens if you can just be a brother or a sister to a person who's asking questions where you're not even trying? You just happen to be the conduit that readily is able to give a response. This is what the scripture says, being able to give an answer Somebody asks, but I don't understand this, or why that? You don't need to be a Bible scholar. You have enough information from all the teaching you've received to be able to give enough of an answer. And instead of going back to making it, and hear me out, instead of looking at this and thinking, well, it's, it's all about faith center and it's all about the church, start with the right vision. The first and right vision is this is all about God, God's kingdom, God's children, God calling people, the names of the entities where people go become secondary, whether they end up at Faith Center or whether they end up down the street over there or that church over there. Now that begins to be, that person has to sort these things out for themselves. But the starting point isn't, I am repopulating Faith Center. The starting point is, this is God's work. God's work is not known by 20,000, 20 million different names. It's known by one, the Church of Jesus Christ. And as much as we may, may not want to say we are attached to every other body of Christ, when I say that meaning any other church that stands for the same principles with the same concept, looking at him who is the author and finisher of faith, you stop then looking at the little pocket that we are and you recognize the greater thing is the kingdom of God. The, the scripture doesn't say, you know, Seek ye first faith center, and then all these other things will be added, <laughs> right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. 
So I even want you to see that my motives underneath this all are not simply about face center, but if we are actually functioning as Christians in a healthy way, in the way that God intended, every single church that's listening to me could be positively affected by understanding the yielding, the submitting, the activity of God through being connected to the vine. If without me you can do nothing, then connected in the vine, you should be unstoppable. Connected in the vine should say all the power to be able to do all that's needed for our time. That doesn't mean that I'm looking ahead to 100 years from now, but in the time that we live, in this present day and age, looking to how can God accomplish his purposes in the now through us here, that's going to be the beginning. And that basically can lead to incredibly transformative experiences for each and every believer who is trusting that this is God's process. The process isn't done by begging and pleading people. Just go back again and look at how the church was built on the day of Pentecost, Peter's sermon, which just keep in mind, Peter was not being prepped and trained. And, you know, Peter's been practicing for 20 years in his, uh, in his little studio office, practicing how to speak publicly until the day that he finally gets to speak publicly. No, oh, men and brethren, these men are not drunken as you suppose, because he wrote that out specifically, you know, as a practice speech, right? <laughs> God raised him up that day. Oh, the information had to be there, but God raised him up that day, and when he opened his mouth, it wasn't though he was opening his mouth going, oh gosh, I'm going to give a lecture in some complicated whatever. It was speaking the truth that he had received, but as God flowed through him. And that, we'll call it energy of light, whatever it is that managed to birth the church into existence. And every single event thereafter that looks like that, the church is being built up. People are coming in. There are people being added. So what I want to say to you and the whole church here. This is not an exercise. I don't want any more band-aids. I don't want people coming up with ideas. I really want this to be, we have reconnected. We have really put our minds to understand branch and vine with all of that power, all of the tools given that we've looked at in Galatians 5 that make it clear I don't need an outside source. I don't need outside ideas. I need to be connected with God. And in that connection, God will aid me to be that very conduit that, who knows? You know, people say, well, uh, you might have a friend. You say, well, I've spoken to this friend before, but I'm going to try again. I think even that is a reverting back to type. Let God lead you. This is a very difficult thing. And paradoxically, when you put it into motion, it's quite easy. Let God guide you, and you will find you are not frustrating God's purposes. Let God guide each and every day. You know, when we talk about this, I touched on this last week. You can be in this word. You can be expecting. You can be faithing. You can be claiming certain things. And then you get up, and you basically throw that all out the window to go and basically go back to ideas you think this is the way God wants this done. It's not going to work. I think that's why God had to bring us to this very moment in time to show us none, none of that works. And by the way, if it could work, we'd have a pretty full church because most of you at least tried to some degree to bring people in. So then the last question is, why don't people come back? You bring guests and people don't come back. And I want you to listen very carefully to this. Most people, because they are so ill-taught, if they have any teaching at all, they think that the pastor needs to be this incredibly likable, like, wow, I'm listening to this person. They are so nice. Their personality radiates niceness and kind. And it's all about the attributes of the individual, instead of, what just happened here? Did somebody just open up the word of God and take me by the hand and show me a word, its meaning, its understanding, its application? This is where people are. So 
I'm just going to tell you, I'm not everybody's pastor. There are people in Hollywood that just absolutely love me and think I'm the cat's meow because I'm outspoken and I don't march by everybody else's beat, and that's great. But they're not here. I don't care. You know what I'm concerned about? The people who actually every single week tune in the people each and every week who are here, or at least tuning in by internet or by radio, who are grappling with this whole concept. You don't have to like the pastor. That, this, is, this is the stuff that has killed the church and why people go to mega churches with mega personalities because there's this person we like and their appearance is good and they're, they're so sweet and syrupy and we like them so much. Find yourself a teacher. Find yourself someone who understands that there's only one thing that's going to matter, and that is getting the word denned into you. Keep hitting that word and getting it to take root, which I can't do. I can just keep repeating. I can keep trying. And sometimes in desperation, because I feel like, why doesn't somebody understand this is the most important thing, yet you cannot fix this because people are stuck with their baggage. They want to come into a church that's the decorations and the everything is so wow. And the only thing that's never really parsed or picked apart, what was said? What did you learn? What was the takeaway? And please, if every time you go to church, you're learning that a little sugar is good on the tongue, friends, you have a problem. Church should make you feel uncomfortable at times. Church should make you like a mirror on some, some passages. Look at yourself and make you face yourself to make you see you haven't arrived or even your pastor hasn't arrived. That we are, constant, we are in constant shifting and movement. Some of it is wasteful and some of it is needful. But for God's sakes, if you're going to come into the church and you say, well, now I want to learn, then that better be the point of departure where you say, okay, I'm here to learn. And the process of it may be frustrating. Okay, you've been teaching on this now. This is message number 19. You've told me about the operation of the Spirit. You've told me I must stay connected. You've told me that there's, there are plenty of things that God desires of me if I will Yield myself like Romans 12 or like Romans 6 says, if I will do certain things, if I will act in faith. Yes, 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 yes. For what purpose then, Pastor? I'm here. I love the Lord. Why, why do I need to engage in any of this? Very good question. Go and read the parables. Most of these parables give a depiction of something. I've used this one many times before. God blessed Three different men. The one man who received the one talent, who put it in the ground. Why? He said, because I knew that you were an austere man. In other words, I knew you weren't going to give me anything in exchange. I just buried it anyway because I couldn't be bothered. Most of us have spent a lot of time like the one talent man. And what about the rest of these? They took the opportunity. You know, you say, well, it was a risk. They took the risk, or they, they, they went to the edge and took a leap of faith. But they did it. They tried. I'm asking you as a congregation to now just think, what are these tools for? And what is my connectedness as the branch to the vine? What is, what is that for? Is that simply that his life force flows through me so that I can be reminded of my salvation, of all the sacrifices, of everything? Is that the sole purpose? Well, I'd say, yes. And no, no, because there's something else to this. To be useful, to be profitable, to be malleable, to be some instrument usable for God's sake. And that is not just people who think, well, that's, that's going to be the person who's called to preach. No, that's every single child of God within the body. Go back and reread the passages that talk about making the comparison where one is an eye, one is a hand, but all belong to the body. This is, these are the concepts I'm talking about. They are inescapable. Now the question is, what exactly are we going to do with everything that I've taught in the last now 19 messages? Is this going to be, okay, let's 
take all the 19 messages. We heard them. We listened to them a couple of times. Okay, Pastor, we got what you said. And we're going to close our Bibles here. And next week I come and I begin teaching on another subject. What happens to the church? Do you get why I'm, I'm here? Do you get why I'm paused here? Because I don't have the sense that everybody understands. You see, this will be the time to sort things out here. This is either going to be people who understand we're at a precipice. We're at a, we could turn everything around by doing what I've talked about, faithing, yielding, praying, and then God gives us the opportunities. Or we can continue the way we've been going. And if that's the case, I'm telling you, we won't be here for too much longer. That's not the boy who cried wolf. That's a person who's telling you, I have done everything in my power to manage the finances of this church, to try and not engage in techniques that I watch every other church engage in under the guise of necessity. I take the most criticism by most people who do not agree. They want to find fault because I don't believe that a lot of these things that are done in the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, are necessarily part and parcel of the church. And every single person that wants to come into the church and say, it's a charity and you need to act charitably, which I've told you the church is not a charity. And do we act charitably? Well, if you're talking about that word as it's properly understood, as in love, the love of God, no greater thing could you share with another human being than the word of God. But to the rest of this, I can't speak. So what I'm saying to you is we still have a problem. The problem has not been solved. Just because I preached and taught on this subject doesn't mean, okay, now we're good. It means we all have some work to do to think about what's been said. The concept alone of being connected to the vine tells me I do not have to go outside the vine for the solution. And in fact, if I'm attached to the vine as a branch, I become basically, hear me out, this is not meant to be blasphemy, but I do become an arm, in, in a sense, for God. Now, God's got abundant strength, and he's got arms of his own, but he uses the conduits, the human arms, if you want to call it, to accomplish his bidding. So all I'm telling you is for the people who actually care about this work, or the work, we'll call it in general, of Christendom, these are important messages to take, to think about and to consider that if we're really wanting to do it God's way, he's laid out the plan, he's laid out the pathway. Now it's for us to understand the purpose and make the application. That alone will determine whether or not we've understood the message. So for right now, I'm going to leave the subject. I may or may not come back to it next week, but I'm asking you to really think about all these messages and what they actually might mean to you not just as a person who attends Faith Center, but to you as a person who is indeed a child of God. I'm just asking you to start reflecting on this, that maybe there is a next step for you and for me to take action on. But that remains to be seen, and whether or not I revisit this subject next week. But for right now, that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.